Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on Ruby, Volume 4, Episodes 9, and World of Remnant, The Great War. So far, we're proven right about Crow. <laughs> that his misfortune is being with them and causing them to split up. Because I have a feeling both Nora and Ren are going to have a better time now. Well, yes, they're not defending a fallen comrade. They are used to working together as a team, and they are avoiding some place that Ren really, really, really did not want to go. Mm-hmm. Of course, we jumped right to the end of it, but I don't care because that was the part that was like, I like this all this stuff, but that's the part I wanted to find out about the most. Also, maybe we should have started with spoilers. <laughs> um, I figured this far into the season, that's heavily implied. <laughs> Now back to the beginning episode with Yang and her father having a sparring contest and him saying that she was off balance, which I also thought maybe might be the fact that she might not be might not have been sending her aura down the fake arm, the robotic arm, which but it sounds like it actually is her sending her aura down the arm because she says it feels real to her. And that it feels natural, which is good. And I think that's because the technology comes from Penny. The technology that went into her and allowed her to have a semblance and aura. Mm. So that technology allows Yang to be able to send her aura down into the technology. Well, could that design and that technical aspect have come first to re-equip injured warriors? And then the technology was later upgraded and improved upon in order to create Penny. Hmm, that too. And I don't know how advanced Mercury stuff is. Is his some of the early prototype stuff? Because his was stolen earlier by the sound of it. Entirely possible, especially if they haven't been able to get him any upgrades to the existing units, or if the upgrades have all been uh, black market. Mm hmm. And Ireward most likely has the latest, or at least the model he likes the most, because it looks like most of his body is that stuff. A decent portion of it. Let's see, I like Zawai and how cute he was and the, here's a towel. <laughs> Good boy. Yeah, yeah, get scratches. And also how he was starting to circle around them in the final sparring match. Mm-hmm. And I had a feeling we were mostly going to focus on Blake and Yang in this one, which they did. But they also gave us some nice little tidbits about Weiss and Ruby and her team. Yes, so it was rather balanced in that, in that we got to touch on something that was happening with each member of Team Ruby. Also, this seems to be the season for father-daughter talks. And all of them good, even though they weren't all good. <laughs> yes, all well done, well written, well executed, even if the conversations themselves were not positive and reaffirming. Mm-hmm. Still want to do something nasty to the father. And once again, I got a new little bit of information that tells me that he's not born of the same blood of his, like his sisters, because he doesn't have the same semblance. And we clearly know that only people in that family can use that semblance. Yes, because Winter says earlier on, when she comes to see Weiss, that all members of the Schnee family automatically have this semblance ability to summon fallen foes to fight for them. So if Whitley doesn't have a semblance or, you know, doesn't have this ability, then uh, how exactly is he a member of the Schnee family? Mm-hmm. And it's just, yeah, more and more pieces fall into place that you, boy, don't belong in this family, and neither does your father. Well, the father married in, but he should be kicked out. Mm-hmm, because he obviously just married in for power. So this brings maybe even more credence to my theory that he did something not good to become part of this family. Oh, yes, I'm quite sure he did something not good. Your earlier theory of killing the original betrothed still holds well. Also finding some semblance or potion that would temporarily make the Shni heiress fall in love with him. Mm. So when she comes out of it, She's stuck. Because we don't know if the kingdom allows for divorce. Hmm. That's a good point. Hmm. Or maybe I'd like you bring up that point about the potion or something similar along those lines. Maybe he actually didn't kill 
the betrothed. Maybe he gave her the potion first and she broke it off with the person she was originally going to be married to. Hmm. And if that's true, a theory just popped into my head. Ironwood. Mm. Because he doesn't really like Ironwood. He tolerates him and says, you're good friends. But the way he says it is more like, you're my property because you're my friend. Yes, and he doesn't like how Ironwood won't uh, fall in line with what he wants because obviously the Schnee family is what makes Atlas. Therefore, all of Atlas should do what the Schnee family wants. And another theory is Ironwood knows the original plan and knows how he got there. Also entirely possible, regardless of however it occurred, if Ironwood was witness or later party to the information or was able to piece all the facts together because he is a very intelligent man in most instances. Hmm. Two theories just popped into my head. One, that if Ironwood is originally the person that Wise's mother was in love with, maybe, hmm, that may be how he got his injuries. The attempted murder. Mm. And Wise's mom thought he was dead. And he stepped in, took over the spot, and then the mother found out after the marriage that Ironwood was still alive. And maybe this is a kind of an out there theory, but maybe Wise's and Winter's true father is Ironwood. Very, very interesting thought there would also... Not that Wise isn't amazing, but also give a little more reason for Ironwood to have extended the offer to Wise that... You're always welcome here. Yes. Because you're my actual daughter. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, maybe we should go back to the intro and say this is the theory episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just all these things started popping into my head. We sometimes do pre-talks before we start recording. This is another one of those instances where we did not. Well, we did some, but not a whole lot. Sometimes we can spend like a good half hour talking before the mics go on. This time was maybe five minutes. Mm hmm And like pieces are starting to fall in place in my head. Like if this is true, this explains a lot about Ironwood's behavior. Yeah. Um, before the mics went on, our theories mostly were evolving around what we saw in the World of Remnant episode. We didn't really spend time theorizing about the main episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was right about that. This is now jumping back into the episodes. And I was right about that girl, one, being a girl, and two, being a chameleon. Yes, and Sun's shadow clones were awesome. Mm hmm Dog pile! Yeah. And apparently he can only hold them for so long. Well, I think it also had to do with the number of them that he used. Mm. I think that's a higher volume than we've seen in previous episodes. And it may be it's meant for quick stuff, like... The last two times we've seen him use it, they don't stay around for long. Mm -hmm. Before we move on to the world of remnant theories, your thoughts on the two episodes? As I've mostly been talking, you've been going with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were on a roll with the theories, and I've learned that if I interrupt you, you often lose a thought. A little bit like a butterfly. Nice to see that Yang's still developing and recovering, and her father's comments about her being off balance we're still having an emotional recovery and emotional growth here. And not just, oh, okay, I can fight with the arm now, let's go. And I'm wondering if she's just going to have one shotgun arm or if they're going to do something so her um, shotguns fit on the mechanical or is it going to be like built in or attachments? Well, it might already be in there and we just haven't seen it yet. Also, the arm looks to be the appropriate dimensions to be her own arm. So I would think her gauntlets could actually fit over it. Mm. And are we going to see her wear a glove over the fake hand? Because Ironwood wears gloves. Yes, so that is another question. Is she going to try and disguise the mechanical aspect? Or is she going to own it? And the reasoning behind each choice. Because it does kind of mark her as uh, being somewhat important because that's a nice piece of technology right there so in certain instances it may be safer to disguise it and we get some more backstory on raven too mm -hmm. I like the whole like i did get informed that my daughter was now an adult <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, so apparently I'm supposed to be talking about this with you and this is a good time because I can use this as a growth opportunity because I see so much of her in you yet you still are your own person and not wholly taking after her. And I do like how he explains that I do love a lot of what I see of your mother in you. I'm just glad you didn't pick up the traits that would cause you the most harm, is basically what he said. Yes. And I'd like us to continue what we're doing so that you are aware and can stay away from those things. Shall we move on to the world of Remnant and then into our theories about it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, very interesting. An interesting thought that, yes, if we don't have emotions and we don't have art or any self-expression... We'll be safe from the grim. Yeah, but humans don't work that way. That's not a good idea. Because that just makes it worse. Because then people start bottling it up and making it more intense. Duh. And a lot of that intensity is going to be negative because it's going to be resentment against self-expression. Especially with the way that one kingdom was doing it where, oh, the higher-ups, the kingdom gets to do all that. But us peasants don't. That's a great way to cause resentment. Well, that was Mistral complying with Mantle in theory. So all the areas that Mantle actually had contact with were in compliance. But everything in the Central Kingdom was business as usual. And I could even see doing that if your outer territory got to keep it as a facade, like, Okay, when Mantle shows up, act like this. Rest of the time, you're good. But they actually enforced it. So that's another form of class segregation. I also like Crow's little thing of like, as you can tell, this place has a lot of jerks. <laughs> yes, and the timing on the animation right there to show that evil grin on the Mistral King. Mm -hmm. And another thing, specifically about the voiceover, it was less of him talking about teaching this time. It was less like him talking to people and it was just him informing. So I think our theory about the other stuff. All being things that he was telling the group around the fire when we just got to cut to the end. It's like, yeah, that's very likely all the information that Crow just gave them. And speaking of Crow, going back to the actual episodes, he was mumbling stuff and I don't think it had anything to do with what was actually going on at the time. No, it sounded like it had to do with something else. I need to go back and like pause, turn the volume up, and really listen because there were some important words in there. I'm pretty sure the word she and something not happening and or it's happening now, something along those lines. I'm pretty sure there was a she involved. The question is, which she is he referring to? His sister? Salem? Ruby? Yang? One of the other three maidens? There, there's a lot of she's. Since we just talked about it, we have a theory about the King of Vale. We think he's either the wizard or a male maiden. Several reasons. One, he is incredibly strong. Two, his color is green, which is Osmond's color. The wizard has been shown to be incredibly powerful, though the wizard was a hermit. So it actually fits more for this to be the wizard rather than being a maiden because he was king of Vale and the wizard was a hermit. So after the treaty was settled at Vital, because he was the last king of Vale, did he then step down completely, hand everything over to the government, you know, because he's established the huntsman schools, he has all his trusted people in place, and he left and became the hermit that we see in the tale of the Four Maidens. Because there seems to be a lot of connections between Ozpin and things in the past, and this king, and just powerful people in general seem to be connected to Ozpin in some way. He also seems to be wise beyond his years. Yes, and you know, he had that line that he said to Ruby that he's made more mistakes than anyone he knows, which either means screwing up a lot in a very short period of time, or having a lot of time to make mistakes. I think it was phrased a little bit differently than you just said, because it seemed to indicate, I think he said something like, then more than any person has. 
which indicates that I have lived longer than most people. <laughs> yes. Regardless of the phrasing, the implication there. Because yes, we read into most things. Well, this happens to be one of those stories where they do a lot of things that you think are unconsequential, and then later you find out they're very consequential. <laughs> yes, because they went to the effort of scripting the series many seasons out. So everything that we're seeing is planned. And, you know, if we went back and rewatched season one right now, we'd probably be like, oh my god, do you see that? Do you see that? <laughs> Look right there. Look right there. That crack in the concrete. <laughs> That's me exaggerating. Though it would be funny. It would. It, it truly would. So do you have more thoughts, nitpicks, so-and-sos? Well, um, going back to Wise's segment in the main episode, reiterate, Whitley's a jerk. Oh, oh yeah, jerk. And apparently her training doesn't matter because now Whitley knows, and she was not at all repentant, which she should not be. Also, she has obviously been training for a long time because when she completed that summon, she had the complete warrior there and under control. Well, I think between each episode, I think we're getting jumps and gaps in time between each person as well. Right, and I'm saying that it's obvious at this point that what we're seeing is the culmination of a lot of training from what we saw in the last episode where she took her sword out of storage. Mm -hmm. But I'm also saying that because obviously there was no time between Blake's segments. There's obviously been time for Yang and Wise that we haven't seen. Yes. So I just thought I'd clear that up for people who would, but there was no time between those two. Well, I think we're actually looking at different timelines as well. Like how long between one episode and the next is different for each one of these segments between the members of Ruby. Yes, because I think there's been a reasonable amount of time for Ruby's group. There was no time for Blake's group. And there was a decent amount of time for both Yang and Wise. Because Yang had been training for a while. And the last we saw... But she had just started sparring with her father. And Weiss has obviously been training for a while because the last we saw, she had just finished moving the furniture. And both of them have made a lot of progress. And speaking of Weiss, I think there was something important about that book that fell off her shelf. Quite likely. I was trying to study it a little bit. I'm like, oh, the writing scribbles. That means I should have been looking more at the cover. I almost was tempted to, like, to call it the Ice Queen because that is an actual fairy tale. <laughs> I believe it's called the Snow Queen more than the Ice Queen, at least in the variants that I've read. But you, you know what I was getting at. I think it has something to do with that. Mm. There wasn't actually any text on the title from what I saw. Or if it was, it may have been in whatever language that's in Remnant. So I guess I didn't see anything like that. But, but the color of the cover and stuff like that and hints we've been getting, yeah, I'm thinking it's a story that's important to Wise's character as a whole. And I'm guessing Winter Queen, Ice Queen based on what she's been referred to in the past by other people and stuff like that. Yes, well, calling someone an Ice Queen is a way to say that they are distant. And the Snow Queen of Fairy Tale, depending on the variant that you read, would either kidnap or lure away young men and put a shard of ice in their hearts that kept them from viewing any good or beauty in the world. And they would spurn their childhood friend, always a female, who had to come rescue them and melt the ice in their heart. Shall we wrap things up? Um, okay, maybe one last thing. Why did Ren put away his guns when he went and ran ahead? Never put away your weapons. It was a signpost. Yeah, when I saw that, I actually thought the exact opposite at first. When he did something with his weapons, I was like, is he pulling them out? Oh, well, no, wait, he's putting them away. <laughs> Yeah, he's putting them away. And yes, we know that Jean, Ruby, and Crow are going to have a much worse time because we saw that lovely, huge, grim footprint. Also, they're still with Crow. Yes. Crow's a cool guy and everything, but that whole semblance thing. Yeah, apparently don't want to hang out with him a whole lot, especially when you're doing dangerous things. But his semblance is probably what's keeping him alive right now. Mm -hmm. Because it causes more misfortune for him to be alive. Yep, and causing misfortune to others. It's kind of like being so unlucky you can't die. <laughs> so, final thoughts on the episodes? 
definitely enjoyed. It was nice to see all four members of Team Ruby within a single episode. I mean, obviously we'd like to spend more time with everyone, but episodes are only so long and, you know, we have the whole rest of season four to get through. Mm -hmm. And I haven't been keeping track of, oh wait, I have. Yes. We're in episode nine. I need to look up to see how many episodes total this season's supposed to be, because if it's 12... <laughs> Then we're almost to the finale, but if it's more than 12, we still have a lot of room to work. Mm-hmm. Well, my final thoughts are I really liked the episode. I liked all the information we're getting, and I like the theories that are now pouring into my head. <laughs> There's so much more thoughts and interesting pieces of puzzles to put together. And they probably all won't be proven or disproven by the end of this season. Help. <laughs> and this has been our thoughts. On Ruby, Volume 4, Episode 9, and World of Remnant, The Great War. Wasn't that what World War 1 was originally called? Because we didn't know there was going to be a World War 2, so it was simply The Great War. And you can help us avoid misfortune by clicking the subscribe button. Or if you like our content enough, please share it with others. Or watch some other stuff on our channel. We've got plenty of videos. Not all of the old ones are good, but hey! Watch them anyways. You can see our progression, both in being able to express ourselves and in Lux's artwork, which to your, well, as not really misfortune, is open for commissions. And since we're talking about art, and if you want to see more of it, you can head over to my DeviantArt, my Tumblr, or my Twitter. Or if you want to see me to continue to progress and want to help me along, please head over to my Patreon, where you can donate a little bit per month to help me keep the lights on. Or if you'd rather not sign up for a subscription, coffee is a vehicle through which you can make a single donation and help us avoid financial misfortune. Once again, thank you for listening and watching.